if you would, join with me in a word of prayer before we open up God's word. Father in heaven, the most important thing that we're asking of you this morning is for your heart to speak to ours. Father, I pray for all of us in here that maybe have distractions that are in our mind, that you would block them out. Father, the enemy wants nothing more than to frustrate our plans this morning, to frustrate our minds, to frustrate our spirit, so that all we focus on is ourselves and we don't hear from you. But Father, we know you are almighty, that you are all powerful, that you can kick out the distractions the enemy puts into our hearts and our minds so that you ring loudly and clearly in our hearts this morning. Keep us focused on your word, Father God, so that your grace would change us and set us on fire to live for you. It's in your name we pray, amen. So if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to James chapter 5, and that's where we'll be this morning. And so for those of you that are here for the first time, we want to say welcome to each of you. We're glad that you are here. And my name is Brad, and I'm one of the pastors here at Hollywood Community Church. And so it's an honor for me to share a message from God's Word with you this morning. And so I hope that you guys have been encouraged during your 21 days of praying and fasting. You guys enjoying it? You guys all right, yep. And we know that when you begin to focus on prayer, when you begin to focus on God, that the enemy is going to work as hard as he can to try to get you off of your 21 days of prayer and fasting. But stay strong, stay encouraged. If you need to text somebody and say, I need you to pray for me and give me strength, do that. That's what we're here for. We're a church family, a church community. And so my wife and I, our lives are not perfect. And My wife and I, before we started off this new series this year, my wife and I have been on a journey ourselves just in what God would want us to do as Christians. And so we have sat back and uh, we're praying and God's been working on our hearts and then this prayer series just happened to align and teach us even further about what God wants us to learn. And so for far too many times in my own prayer life, I have had a mere mentality you might be saying, Brad, what, what in the world is a mere mentality? What are you talking about, a mere mentality? You guys hearing a whistling? Am I bothering you with the whistling? No? No? Okay. Here we go. So for me personally, I would sp- spend time in prayer confessing my sins, right? I would worship God. I would bring my request to God, and I, would, and I would pray things like, God, forgive me for my sins. God, provide for us financially. God, help me to be a better husband. God, help me to see people the way that you see people. God, help my anger with people when they cut me off in traffic. God, help me with people who are rude for no reason. God, help me to be peaceful when people say hurt for things about Kelly or myself. God, help me to understand your word when I read it. Father, teach me to forgive. And then in my prayer life, I would have prayers for others. God, help those who are sick and hurting. God, help the poor and the needy. God, help those struggling with addictions. God, save so-and-so's soul. God, help the orphans and the widows. And I would lift up these prayers, and you might be thinking, Brad, what is wrong with those prayers? Aren't those all good things to pray? And I would tell you, yep, absolutely right. Those are all great things to pray. They're all important things to pray, and they're all things we should be praying for. But here's where the struggle is. Here's where my personal struggle was, is I would get off my knees in prayer, and I would live out a mirror mentality. What does that mean? That means as soon as I got off my knees in prayer, Everything I did in my world was about me. God, I want you to answer my request. So I'm waiting and responding and just doing life, looking at myself, waiting for God to answer. I'd go to Publix, but the only person I could see is myself because all I'm thinking about is the toilet paper and the laundry detergent that I have to pick up from the store because Kelly told me about it 10 times and I gotta make sure I get it. But I don't see the people that are standing right in front of me that are hurting and broken. I go to Starbucks and get Kelly a coffee, but I don't see anybody else except the coffee and myself because all I see is myself because all I'm thinking about is me, but yet the people around me are hurting and struggling, but I can't see it because every 
everywhere I go, I'm looking in a mirror only looking at myself. And so, yeah, my prayers go up, but then there's no action on my part because all I'm looking at is myself. Are you with me this morning? You see, here's what God had to teach me. I was present where the needs were, but I wasn't aware of their presence. You get me? I was present where the needs were, but I wasn't aware of their presence because of my mere mentality. See, there were people who were struggling with depression, and their actions and their voices were calling out for me to stop, for me to ask them, how is their day going? But I was looking at myself. There are people who are struggling in needs. Their hunger is coming out saying, I want food. I desire food. But because I have bills to pay and because I'm on my way to work, I don't have time or the resources to help your need. And I had a mere mentality. Sure, I was praying for myself and I was praying for others. But yet my actions we're showing that the only thing I cared about was that God would answer my prayer requests. Have you been there? You see, I know I'm not the only one that struggles with the mirror mentality. There's a lot of us that have a mirror mentality. There's some of us, maybe it's a spouse that's crying out for you to honor them, for you to put your, their needs above yours, but you can't because all you see is yourself and all you're worried about is yourself, so it just becomes about you and your spouse suffers and sits there and cries because you're not investing in them. Or maybe it's a child that needs you to spend more time with them and invest in them, but you don't because I just got so much to do. And I want God to do things to answer my request. I don't have time for you. And all you do is look at yourself. Or there's a coworker who's a single parent who has needs, who has things. I mean, can somebody just watch my kid for an hour? Just an hour so I could get some stuff done around the house so I could get some, Or maybe they're in need of groceries, but we don't see it because we're consumed by our own prayer requests that we're not looking out for the needs of others. Or it's a neighbor of ours that needs to know Jesus, but we can't have a conversation with them because all, again, we're thinking about is what we want and what we're needing from life. You see, many times for all of us, we have prayers that go up, but that's where it ends. Our prayer doesn't cause us to go to action, to actually reach out to those that are in need, to be aware of the needs around us. And many of us don't go out and love our community because our prayers turn inward but our actions never go outward into our communities, into our places where we visit, and we maintain a mere mentality. Now, now here's what happens, churches, and I'll, here it is. Our churches across America, in Florida, are mostly not seen as a place of love and grace by those on the outside. Am I right? I'm not making it up. We have been seen as judgmental, hypocritical, self-seeking, self excuse me. The community has lost faith in the churches because this is what they see. Churches gather for prayer, but then it leads to nothing for them. We spend hours in prayer, but the hurts and the needs are still in the community because many churches that should be the light are seen as just another place where people only care about themselves, right? Have you seen this to be true? Yeah, I've seen it to be true. And how do I know? Because I've had that mentality. I've struggled and wrestled with the mirror mentality. We all do. We're all born as selfish people. It's what sin is. I want what I want, when I want it, how I want it, where I want it, and you can't do nothing about it because this is what I want. That is at its core of all of our idolatry and sin is us thinking about ourselves and our own mirror mentality. And so how do we break this mirror mentality where we get away from just seeing ourselves so that we can engage the world? You see, we have to have a change of perspective. We have to move from a mirror mentality to a magnifying glass mentality. 
You ever use a magnifying glass as a kid? I know I did. I used to use it to like burn leaves and start fires. I didn't use it for anything else scientific, like looking at things up close. But what it does is it gives you laser focus. It brings everything up close so you can get real close to whatever it is you want to look at and what you want to see. It makes that thing really present before your face and before your mind. And this is what a magnifying glass mentality does for you. It allows you to focus on the hurt, the struggle, and the pain of those people that are in need all around us each and every single day. And when you decide every day to say, okay, God, today I'm going to have this mentality It allows you to become aware of the burdens that are before you, the burdens that are around you. You will see people the way that Jesus does. You will have compassion on them. Now catch this, not because they've earned it, but you will have the compassion on them because they deserve it. And why do these people deserve it? It's because they are created in God's image, every single one of them, no matter what they've done in life. That means murderers, the sexually immoral, prostitutes, drug addicts, whoever it might be, they are deserving of God's love because they're created in God's image. And if we had a magnifying glass, we would see them for who they are, not what they do. We need to change our perspective. We need to make a conscious choice through the Spirit's power and the Spirit's strength to see them as they are, to have a magnifying glass. This morning, we're going to see that there is power in prayer to change a community. And so this is the one thing that I put down in your notes that I'll repeat a few times this morning. It is this, healing comes down when prayers go up. Healing comes down when prayers go up. And this morning's passage, we are going to be in James chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 13 through 20. And as you're turning, you may already be there, but as you're getting ready to look into it, I want to set the context for you because we're jumping right into the very end of the book of James. And so we kind of missed the whole first few chapters. And so I want to, to, to capture what James has in mind. He's writing this letter to the 12, 12 tribes of Christians that were scattered about during this time. And he's writing to them to encourage them to live out their faith within a community of believers. Everybody say community. This is community. Christian life is to be done in a community. James is not writing to individual Christian to go live an individual life in his individual house and never engage the world and never engage any other believer and never engage those. He's not writing to that person. He's writing to believers that are within the context of a community. And he says, guys, look, when you have persecutions of all kinds and trials, have joy. Put your faith into action. Don't just say you're doing the word. Actually live the word. True religion is this. Visit the orphans and the widows and keep yourself untainted by the sinful world. Treat everyone equally. Tame your tongue. Meet the needs of others. Don't just wish them well. And he says this way. If somebody says, hey, I'm hungry and I need food, you don't tell them, hey, I hope you get food. Be warm. I'll pray for you. He says, no, if you have food, give them food. He says, avoid wickedness. Use your riches to help others. Be patient and live for God until he returns. And then we get to James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. And up to this point, James is encouraging us. How do we truly live in community? It's by living out all those things that we just talked about up to this point. A healthy community is one where people truly love one another, they truly look out for the needs of one another, and they step outside their mere mentality, and they truly show what forgiveness and love and reconciliation and grace and restoration and healing is really like, and then the watching world will sit back and say, wow, these people are acting differently. What is it about it? And as Jesus says, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. He wants us to be a healthy community. And when we truly live these principles out through the Spirit's help and power, we will become a church where people can be healed, people can be restored, and this church will become a light to those who are walking in darkness. So what is the key to living out a healthy community? What is the key to living out a magnifying glass mentality? And here's where it is. 
Healing comes down when prayers go up. It's the power of prayer is what allows us to have the key to love people the way that God wants us to love them. Look at verse 13 with me. It says this, is anyone among you suffering? Let him what? Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. James gives us the principle right away. You want to live a life that sees others the way that God does? It begins, continues, and is sustained through a life of prayer. It's the only way. It's the only way we can tap into God's spirit. It's the only way he can search our hearts and change those areas where we need to grow. It's the only way that God would strengthen us to be the people he wants us to be is through prayer. And he asked the first question, are any of you suffering? And he knows that these Christians during this time were suffering trials of all kinds. They were being persecuted. Some were being thrown into prison, beaten. Some were killed. Some were tortured. He also knew that many of them lost relationships with their family and friends because they became a Christian and they weren't being the same religion they were before. And so he knew that people were suffering all kinds of things. He knew that they were suffering things financially. They didn't have their needs met. Maybe they were displaced and they didn't have a home to live in. And some would fall victim to sickness and disease. And he tells them, if you're suffering, do this one thing. Pray. And not just pray by yourself. It's grabbing your friend. James, I need you to come here. I am struggling with this. Pray for me. It was a community that looked out for each other, that was praying for one another. They would pray in their personal life, yes, but it also led to them praying for one another. And for us, in today's world, it's the same thing. We pray for ourselves, but we need one another to pray with us and for us and ask God to give us his patience, his endurance, and his strength to get through whatever suffering that we are walking through. And then James asked the question, are any of you cheerful? Now, easy times in life are when everything is happy, right? We love the seasons when everything is good, our job's good, our marriage is good, our friendships are good, everything is smooth sailing, and everything is right in the world, and we couldn't have anything, we're comfortable. And what does James tell us to do in those moments? He says, sing praises to God. And when you sing praises to God, what are you doing? Praying. And so what is James telling us here? What if you're suffering? And then if you're on the other extreme where you're happy and everything else that comes between those two things, your goal is to do what? Pray. And pray believing. Right? And so the key for us to shake this mentality so we can have this one is prayer. It's the only way that it will happen. You see, if you have something to be thankful for that you're happy about, that's the time when you say, God, thank you for waking me up to go to this job. Thank you for giving me a job, right? God, thank you that my eyes open this morning and there are breath in my lungs because every day is a gift from God and we should thank him for it. But then in those moments where we are struggling and we are suffering, we're angry, we're frustrated, it's in those moments where we bow our knee and say, God, I'm frustrated and I'm angry because of this. And right now, I don't have joy. Right now, I have bitterness. Change that to joy. And then it's being honest and transparent with other people in our community. I mean, look around. There's hundreds of people in here this morning that if you went to them and said, here's what I'm struggling with. Can you pray for me? Guess what they would do? They would pray for you. But too many times we hold on to it. We keep it secret. A healthy community is one that will pray together. And then what is... Paul, the Apostle Paul says it this way in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. He encourages the same thing. He says, pray without what? Pray without ceasing. Ongoing, constant line of prayer. This is the foundation of living in Christian community. This is what allows God to work in our hearts, but also gives us a proper perspective of the community that is around us. And a proper perspective realizes that prayer never ends with ourselves. It is always bigger than us, and it is always outside of us. Look at verse, verses 14 through 16. James says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. 
and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who was sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed. This passage has some debate over about what kind of sickness James is addressing. And so I'm just going to kind of clear up kind of the mud that surrounds this passage. God, first of all, is most important, is most, is most focused on spiritual health. That's most important because that's how you begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no other way to the Father than putting your faith in him and him declaring you righteous and you having forgiveness of sins. There's no other way. The, the sickness of sin is the most important thing to God that he cares about. First and foremost, he is about saving souls, seeking and saving the lost. That's first and foremost. But here in this passage, James is addressing those who are dealing with some kind of physical sickness. Because he knows during this time, think about it, their medicine field is not like the field we have. And things that we have cures for, they didn't have it back then. And especially if they're being persecuted and mistreated and not getting the food they need, there is all kinds of diseases that can creep into their lives. And James knew there was going to be people that were sick. And what should they do about it in this community when people were sick? They should call for the elders of their church to come and pray for them. And look how the community responded. When they called for the elders to come and pray, what should the elders do? Should they sit at Starbucks? Hey, John, I'm going to pray for you. I know you need me to come by, but I'm at Starbucks, and my prayer is going to work the same way. So I'm just going to pray from here, sit on my cell phone, and I'm going to be here. Or I'm going to pray for you from my house, and so I don't need to come over and be there with you. I'm praying from my house. Have a good day. I hope God blesses you. Is that what the elders are to do? Is that what the community is to do? Look at what it is. They went to where the sick were. They were present with them. Isn't there just something about someone's presence when you're in the middle of your mess and sickness? When they're there just to hold your hand and say, hey, you know what? I know you don't feel good, but I love you, and I'm going to pray with you. Do you know how much that means to that person that is a part of this community when the church goes and is present with them, prays with them, prays for them, and prays over them. See, then it also shows us the second thing from this passage, that the elders were present with them, but also says that they brought their own oil to anoint them. Now, you have to remember, they didn't have a Hollywood community church back then that would buy Lord's Supper supplies, that would buy oil to go and anoint the sick. So where did they get the oil from? They took it from their own house. They used the supply of oil that they had and would go and would anoint the sick with the oil and were using it as a medicinal purpose, but they spent their own resources to meet the needs of this person. And so how does that translate for us today? Our heartbeat should be the same. When someone who is sick, guess what? They have needs, especially if they've been in the hospital for a while. Think about it. How are they going to go and get groceries for their family if they're the ones that normally go? Maybe it's us coming alongside saying, you know, we're just going to take, we'll go buy your groceries for you. Maybe it's, hey, you know what? I know you can't cut your grass. We're going to cut your grass for you. Hey, you got a lot of kids that are running around the house. We're going to babysit them for you for a few hours. We're just going to take them out so you don't have to worry about finding all that. It is us looking at that person when we're present with them and seeing the needs of them and saying, how can we give of our time and our resources so that we can alleviate the pain and the struggle that you have in your life? You see, this is what James is encouraging us to do, to have a healthy community. And then James goes on to say that the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven. And at this point, I know there's, this is a pressure point passage. It was for me in my own life. I'm sure you've had somebody who was sick that you prayed for and they didn't get better. And some of your loved ones have even passed away. And you say, James, what are you talking about here? You say, if I pray for them, 
they're going to get healed, but yet my loved one didn't get healed. James, are you not telling us the truth? What's happening here? You see, we have to realize that God's perspective is always different than our perspective. And that here's the thing that I had to learn in my own life. When my dad was in the hospital and I prayed that God would heal him and God didn't and he died, at first I thought, God, you're mean and you're cruel. But then God had to change my perspective. Can any of us ever be perfectly healed on this side of heaven? I mean, all of us at some point in time are going to get the cold, the flu, the bronchitis, the itis, whatever you want to call it. And there's going to be a struggle in our bodies. We are never perfectly healed. And sometimes people are healed on the other side of earth when they're ushered into God's presence. That we can never be perfectly healed on this side. Sometimes God chooses to heal people physically, but most of the time, well not most of the time, but sometimes he heals when that person is ushered into his kingdom and finally all the pain and suffering is gone for that person. You see, we as humans want the healing to happen here and now. But James says God will bring healing to that person, but here's the point. Leave it up to God to work it out according to his good and perfect plan. You see, we should be encouraged to pray for these people that they would be healed. And we shouldn't have prayers where, God, I hope that you would want to heal this person. God, I... No, we can pray confidently and say, God, we trust that you have the power to heal her. God, we know that you are the great physician, that all you have to do is speak the word, and this person will be healed. This person will get up out of the bed, will walk again, will go out and do life again. Father, we believe that you have the power to do it. We believe you can do the impossible, and so we're trusting you. Then the confident prayer of faith is this, sitting back and saying, okay, God, if you choose not to heal on this side of life, it's okay, we trust you, because your ways are higher than our ways, and your plan is better than our plan. And you sit back and let God do the work that he wants to do in that person's life. And then in this passage, James says that some people are sick because of unconfessed sin in their life. So we have to be careful. So many times I've seen in churches where people will say, oh, you have a sickness because there's some sin that you need to go confess. Let's put the, all the cards on the table. Sometimes sickness happens because of sin, like it's just a sinful nature, this world is corrupt, and it's just part of the curse of sin. There are some people who do have a sickness because of their unconfessed sin, and it is not our job, church, to be the ones to tell them that. It's not, well, let me figure out why you're sick. You kind of do this throughout the week, and so I'm thinking it's kind of this. No, 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 no. That person knows if it's related to unconfessed sins. Let God deal with that person. Our role is to come alongside that person and pray for them. And here's what it says for the person who does have unconfessed sin. If they confess it within this community, guess what? Guess what they get? Guess what they receive? Verse 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be what? Healed. Healing is available for those who have the unconfessed sins in our life. But here's here's the thing, church. We have to be a better community that allows people to confess their sins to us. See, I'm afraid that there are too many people who don't confess their sins to us because in the past when they've told somebody I can't believe you would do that how did you even walk into church this morning they've been judged for it they've been kicked out of a community group because of it like church we have to do a better job to make this a place we all have to understand that we're all broken Put our self-righteous selves to the side. None of us are more deserving of God's love than anybody else. Well, my sin's better than their sin's. Do you hear yourself? Our sin is just as offensive to God as somebody else's sin. 
It separates us from God, just like everybody else is. When we understand we're all broken, we're all one bad decision away from throwing our life into the toilet, it can happen to any of us at any time. The Bible says the heart is exceedingly wicked above all things. We all have our stuff. We need to be a place where people can share in confidence and say, this is what I'm wrestling with. I am wrestling with this lust in my life. I can't stop looking at pornography. Can you help me? And for us to respond and say, you absolutely bet I will. Let's pray right now. Let's figure out how we could do discipleship together. Because here's the reality, church. Get away from your mirror, pick up the magnifying glass, and remember that love is patient. Love is kind. Love is long-suffering. Love covers a multitude of good things, covers sins. And I think too many people are suffering all on their, on their own because they feel if they share this, they're going to be ostracized from the church. And here's what happens to those people. They quit coming to church. And when they quit coming to church, an idle mind is a devil's playground, And the devil will have a heyday with them. And they will walk out of this place and will struggle for years to come until God reigns them back. We need to become a healthy community where people are comfortable confessing their sins. So why? So that they can find healing and restoration and reconciliation and brotherly and sisterly love. You see, healing comes down when prayers go up. James 16 5.16, the end of it says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months, and he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. And so when you get to the phrase, the effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much, I don't know anybody else, but I remember the first time I read that and the 60th time I read that and the 100th time I read that. I've always had, what does that mean, the effective prayer of a righteous man? What, what is the idea? Effective, the Greek word has the idea it's related to energy. In other words, it is the exercising the working, the consistency, the earnestness, the steadfast prayer, the one that is constantly going before God saying, God, make me a better husband. God, break my addiction. God, break my idols in my life. It is the one that is constantly standing before God and declaring, God, do these things in my life. Change me. It's going to God over and over and over again. It is keeping that prayer line open is the one that can accomplish much. But again, we have to remember this. This is not happening individually. Imagine if the whole church, all hundreds of us, were praying for the needs in our community to do incredible and huge things out there, how much God could accomplish when God's people pray. And then James says this, You have the same nature as Elijah. The same nature. And he prayed that God would stop the rain, and God stopped it. And he prayed that God would start the rain, and God started it. And he's saying, you can do the same through your prayers. What is he, why does James mention this story? Why does he throw this in here, right? I mean, of all the people that pray, why this one? See, here's the context of where you find this. You can find it in 1 Kings chapter 17 all the way through 1920. And here's what's going on. The king of the Jews, king of Israel, Ahab, was labeled as the worst king Israel had ever had. Like, he was the most evil king at that time that Israel had ever had in their entire history brought idolatry into all of Israel, had the prophets of Baal. Baal was set up being worshipped, worst king of all time. Well, as the king is bad, guess what happened to the people? 
the people became bad. They started worshiping idols. And so now you have this community that Elijah loved, that Elijah cared about, and he sees all of them way off track, stuck in their wickedness, stuck in their addiction. And Elijah had two choices. One, I can have a mirror mentality and say, well, I know I'm worshiping the true God, so I'm good. Or he could sit back and say, no, you know what? This isn't good. My community is stuck in their lostness, their brokenness, their wickedness, and their idolatry. Something has to happen. And what does he do? He hits his knees in prayer. And he says, God, turn the hearts of Israel back to you. God, I pray that you would stop the rain, not so I can look cool, not so somebody could say, wow, Elijah, God answered your prayer that he made the, the, the rain stop. You're so cool. You're so awesome. No, 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 no. He prayed that. Why? So that Israel and Israel's king would repent of their sins and turn back to God. What did Elijah care most about? He cared about people in his community receiving healing, reconciliation, and restoration with their Father in heaven. And he went to battle for them on his knees. You see, there was three years and six months when God stopped the rain until it started again. And Elijah was praying for his community. And within this story, this is where you see the greatest showdown. Who is God? Is it the prophet of Baal? Is it Baal or is it the true God? And he sets up a showdown with all the prophets and they build two, off the, two altars, one for Baal, the other for God. And the prophets of Baal, they ran around yelling crazy things, doing all these things, trying to call fire down from heaven, and it doesn't happen. Then Elijah says, soak my altar over and over again with tons of water. He prays to the true God, God, for your name, for your glory, show these people you are real. Bring these people hearts back to you. And fire consumes the altar. It goes up. And all the people said, wow, your God is the true God. And the hearts of the people were turned back to their God. They received healing and restoration. You see, Elijah realized that his prayers were bigger than himself. He had to pray for the needs of his community. There was no other way. And so many people, they want to focus on God stopping the rain as the focus of the prayer. That's not the point. The point James includes this is, look, guys, if you would pray for the needs of those around you, and you tap into God's heartbeat where you say, God, I want you to take to break homelessness in the city of Hollywood. God, I want you to find a way to help these single parents find a way to support their families and raise them in the things of the Lord. God, I want you to find a way to break people from their, from their prostitution, to break people from their addictions. God, do something incredible. Do whatever you need to do so that you can see these people turn back to you. And James is telling us when we begin to care and pray for our community, we're going to see things happen in that community. You see, Pastor Brian a few weeks ago shared a prayer video uh, with you guys where this lady and she, was a group of ladies went into uh, this neighborhood that was known for all the crime and all the poverty and all these things. And they walked every day for 52 weeks around this community for God to break the strongholds to give them opportunities, praying for people to be saved. And after 52 weeks of praying for this community, she said it was like a floodgates were opened where now they've been welcomed into that community. They started to do ministry within that community and the community is beginning to change because they prayed for that community for God to do something great because God cares about all those things. If you look at scripture, God does not care most about people who have their life together. I'm sorry to say it, folks. You look at what God cares about, read Isaiah 58. It's the hungry, setting the oppressed free, setting the prisoners free, taking care of the widows, taking care of the fatherless, taking care of the orphans, giving of ourselves so that others will be blessed. It is us realizing that we shouldn't just care about God answering our prayers, that we have to be a people that have to realize that God wants us to be an answer to someone else's prayer. Did you catch that? 
God wants to use us to be an answer to someone else's prayer. And we have to decide every day, every moment, are we this or this? Because really it does come down to a choice. You see, I told you earlier at the beginning of this message, message that Kelly's been, um, God's been working on Kelly and I's heart with this. And literally, the very first day of the 21 days of prayer and fasting, I come into my office, and I'm sitting down and I'm working, and our children's director, Jaquetzia, comes up to me and says, hey, there's this father out there that's trying to walk his daughter to an elementary school, and he doesn't know where it is, can't find it, and he only speaks Spanish. Can you go give him a ride? Now, sitting at my desk in the middle of work, mirror mentality, Man, I have so much to do this week. I have follow-up to do. I got to get these things done. I got stuff to work on. I got to do database work. Like, I just got a lot going on. And I don't speak Spanish. I don't know how I could be a help to them. And so I don't know what's going on. And so mirror mentality was maybe somebody else could take them. But then God had been challenging my heart already to realize that when you begin to pray for God, to use you to meet the needs of those, he will give you opportunities to do that. And you have to be obedient in those moments. And so I said, okay, sure, to get to, I'll go do it. As long as somebody tells him that I'm going to take him to the school, we're good. Then that very same day, I go to the grocery store at night to go get cat food, of all things. And I'm standing in line at the grocery store, and there's this lady in front of me. And again, God's been challenging me to be present where the needs are. And this mom's with her kid, probably 11, 12 years old, her son. And she's buying this food, and then she swipes the card, and it doesn't go through. Now, I've been there, so I know what that's like. Already, I'm like, I feel your pain, girl. I feel your pain. And I was like, I'm hoping it's just like you didn't, you just went too fast. And so I've had those moments too. Well, you just did too fast. Do it again. So the lady, she, the mom swipes it again, and then it doesn't go through, and I'm like, oh, that's a struggle. And then the cashier takes her card, let me try it for you, and I'm like, okay, I hope this works, like, this is going to be good, because I'm, 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 I'm dying for the lady, because I know how embarrassing that is. And so the cashier does it, and it doesn't go through, and then the cashier gets on the phone, customer service, we need you on aisle number five, and all of us, like, that was the moment where God tugged my heart, and here's the moment where he tugged my heart, the mom puts the card in her wallet, and she goes, I don't have any other form of payment. And I had a mirror mentality. Either I have bills to pay too. I got to pay for food. But in that moment, that mirror mentality was pushed to the side. And I said, you know what? I'm going to pay for that for you. And she goes, no, no, no. And I said, no, you guys need to eat. That's most important. You see, I have to be present. I'm not sharing this story to say, Brad, wow, what a good job you did. Why I'm sharing this with you is because when you pray for God to make you aware of burdens and needs in the community, and you're really present where you are to see people the way that God does, God's going to put people before you to meet their needs. And here's the coolest part. You're always able to meet those needs. You see, she didn't say, I have a million-dollar payment, Brad. Can you? I would have been like, I'm out on that one. I'll buy you your milk. But the need was there in front of me where I could meet it. And then a few days later, Kelly texted me while I was at work, and she said, hey, Brad, um, would you be interested in hanging out with third through fifth graders at my school? She teaches at a public school. The assistant principal wants to start a male mentoring program for a public school. Now, again... Am I going to be this or this? You see, I told her, I said, okay, in. Why? Because I'll be able to go to a place and teach godly principles in a worldly environment to love on these kids who don't have that love at home, a be a light in their life. And here's the coolest part. I didn't have to do anything for this opportunity. 
I wasn't writing emails and faxing them, can I get into your school and break in and do a mentoring program? God opens the opportunities for you. You might sit back and say, Brad, but there's a lot of needs out there. Yep, you're right. Brad, I can't meet all the needs in the community. Yep, you're right. But here's what happens. If you, 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 and you, and you, and you, and you, and all of you up there, if all of us would just be present where we are and pray God use us to meet the needs, and we all are meeting needs where we are, we can ease the burdens of a lot of people in our communities, and we could see healing and restoration come. Amen? So it's a collective task, and it's a collective responsibility, but it's also the mission that God commanded us to be on. Jesus was all about seeking and saving the lost. And as you read the Gospels, you look at who he went to. He met needs of people everywhere. And some people might say, well, Brad, but if I meet everybody's need, I'm just going to enable them. Can we throw that word in the toilet, church? Can we? Because how much enabling did we need for us to put our faith in Jesus Christ? How long did God have to pour his grace into our lives till we realize the goodness, the love, and the mercy that he has for us? Well, Brad, if I give them this meal, they're just going to go spend their money on drugs. Who cares? Because what if the 85th time somebody shows them that love and the light bulb clicks on? You see, when God brings the moment, and he puts it on your heart to meet a need, do it, and leave the results up to God. God knows what he's doing, we don't. Amen? So, when all of us pray for a healthy community, and we truly reach out to our community, we can see the city of Hollywood healed in a way we've never seen before. It is possible, church. And our God can do the impossible, and guess what? He desires to do the impossible. And so healing comes down when prayers go up, and that should be our heartbeat for our community and those outside these four walls. And so here's what I would challenge you to do today. Pray for your personal life. Those things are great. Pray that God would work in you. Pray for others. Those things are great. But then also pray, okay, God, help me today to meet the needs of those around me. And just sit back and watch as God brings people into your life and brings needs before you and how you can be used by God. Not for your honor, not for your glory, but it's all to love these people so they can know their father. When they say, why are you doing this for me? It's because, well, because Jesus loves you and he wants you to know that. That's why we're doing it. So begin to pray those prayers and God will bring you the opportunities. And then you gotta decide, do you wanna be this or this? Choose this. Bow your hearts with me this morning. Father God, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that you constantly are challenging us to put ourselves to the side, to focus on what really matters, and that's loving you. And Father, we thank you that you do give us blessings, but all with the idea that you bless us so we could be a blessing to others. And Father, yes, we have requests that we're waiting on for answers, but let us really know and to really live out the fact that it is more, if we pray, we get on our knees so that we can get on our feet and be an answer to prayer for others, Father God. Give us eyes to see them the way you do, eyes of compassion and eyes of love, to see every person as worthy of your love, and that we would be able to have the opportunity to meet a need and to tell them that it's all because of Jesus of why we're doing this. Father, I pray for everybody that is in this room today. Let us be a healthy community that truly becomes a beacon of light, that is a lighthouse to the lost, that people come here and say, there's just something so different about this place, and I just can't believe you guys are selfless, and you're so giving, and you're so, you care more about giving than receiving, and Father, creating that so that, here's why, so that the hearts of this community will be turned back to you, that souls would be saved, and they would give your name praise and your name honor, Father God. That is the cry of our heart. Do in us, Father, what you need to do so that we can reach this community for you. It's in your powerful name we pray. Amen.